Welcome to the CERC channel. We're now in the vault of the Natural History Museum here in downtown Los Angeles. And we're here talking to Aaron Celestian, a perfect name for what we're going to do today, <laughs> about gems, precious, and um, famous stones. And we're actually now in front of one of those, the Juliet Pink. Well, the Juliet Pink is a little bit over 30 carats in size. It's one of the world's largest pink diamonds in existence. And you can see it's an oval cut, and it's very clear, very little impurities. Diamonds themselves are, are generated from extremely high pressures and temperatures. Originally, uh, it's probably 90 carats to 100 carats in size when it came out of the ground, very massive. And it came from about 150 to 200 miles down below the surface of the Earth. Probably uh, erupted in somewhere around South Africa and later discovered as this, as this diamond. Can you tell us a bit more about how you determine the preciousness of a gem? Gem preciousness comes from a variety of factors. Most commonly, they're graded by their cut, their color, their clarity and their carats, which is how much they weigh. We also have some other extremely rare diamonds in the case uh, right behind you, the Argyle Violet, which is probably one of the world's largest violet diamonds. So the Argyle Violet is named the Argyle Violet because it's a violet diamond, and it comes out of the Argyle Mines in Australia. It is the largest violet diamond ever recovered from the mines, which is the largest producer of violet diamonds. It might also be the largest violet in the world. The violet here is caused by slight hydrogen impurities inside okay. of it which caused the, the distinct color from the pink color and the purple in fact on this Victorian orchid are from the same coralline origin. It's not caused by chemical impurities, it's caused by slight deformations of the atoms within the structure itself. So as the diamonds are rising up very quickly to the surface of the earth, they get slightly deformed. They don't break, but they get deformed and that causes the pink. So Aaron, can you tell us a bit more about this phenomenal rainbow diamond necklace and what's special about it? It consists of about 88 diamonds all the way through the necklace. The rainbow of colors that exhibit in this diamond are, are fairly tremendous. Almost all the colors of diamonds are exhibited in this necklace. When the light goes down, you also see the interesting phenomenon that is fluorescence. So under an ultraviolet light, these diamonds will glow these different colors. The diamond is essentially 100% carbon, except for a few, many millionths of those atoms are replaced with something else. And when they are, there's electrons kind of stuck inside of this crystal structure. And when you shine high energy light on it, those electrons jump up to a higher energy orbital and go back down. And then when they go back down, they re-release light. Yeah, what kind of spectrum of color is missing from this? phenomenal necklace. Violet is missing from that phenomenal necklace. <laughs> Such a rare, rare colored diamond. Also, a pure blue is missing from that as well, but it consists of greens and pinks and reds and oranges and, and blue grays. These types of colors and diamonds are extraordinarily rare, especially the purple and the violet and the pink. And so we were really excited to bring that kind of rarity to exhibition at the Natural History Museum. We're now here in front of this incredible opalescent rainbow of colors. What makes uh, a gem opalescent? So opals are not crystalline in nature. What they are is essentially nanospheres of silica that are stacked together. The balls themselves are arranged in a very periodic pattern. Okay. And when that periodic pattern is extended for a long distance on the nanoscale, then it gives rise to a diffraction effect causing the rainbow of colors that you see. Some of the opals generate holographic images and exactly the phenomena that governs that is not totally well understood. But what it is is that most of the opals that you see here in the mm -hmm. front in these rings, you can see that the color is somewhat embedded in yeah, the opal it's itself. Not, yeah. But some of the rare opals, like the ones from Ethiopia, the colors are diffracted above and focused above the surface of the opal itself, giving it this sort of holographic image effect. So we're in front of the California gemstones. I just want to say this is maybe the most architectural vitrines because of the geometrical qualities, the natural setting, and because in a, in a way I think architects, like many actually creative people, look at these gems um, for the geometrical qualities and the colorations. And they have a sense of order, which I think architects in general like, and, and a geometrical formation that is between the handmade and the natural made. Can you tell us about the process of going from a natural stone to a gem that is cut? When they come out of the ground, they'll look like what are called rough, 
which are the natural forms that you see behind each of the gym. And to find a rough that is large enough and clear enough to be cut a gem is actually quite rare and quite difficult to do. So for example, this bonito white right here in front, uh, this is California State Gem. It only grows gem quality bonito white in one place on earth in California. And how to go from those triangular shaped crystals to this gem is a painstaking process. You have to look under a microscope to see where you can fit a gem inside of that and how you can cut away the bits and pieces that you don't want and then eventually polish down each surface. How do you go from an opaque color to such a brilliant one? <laughs> so it's the polishing process that brings out the color a lot and that's why gemstones have such great intrigue and, and attraction to them is that you go from this rough color, some, somewhat pink color, but when you polish it, then the light can penetrate deeper into the crystal, refract around and bounce off of the facets of the polished gem and enhance the color. My research and my expertise is in the design and architecture of how atoms are arranged in space to generate these beautiful gems and crystals. So Aaron, thank you so much for your time today. I learned a lot from you and I think everybody was very interested in this incredible, wonderful world of gems. And thank you for watching Sark Channel.